Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. In order to get in as many members as possible, I would appreciate short and succinct questions and responses. And at question number one, I call Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to tackle population decline in the Argyll and Butte constituency and other rural areas. Cabinet Secretary Angus Roberts. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There is no quick fix for the challenges leading to depopulation, and we must work with regional, local and community partners to ensure that we collectively deliver a sustainable solution to the challenges facing our rural and island populations. Many of these challenges have been exacerbated by Brexit, the increased barriers to migration, which has helped offset an ageing population and keep services running, will leave a particularly damaging gap in our rural communities, and the Scottish Government continues to call upon the UK Government to make vital reforms to the immigration system to meet Scotland's needs. Jenny Minto. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Scotland's rural communities often face social and economic challenges for a range of different reasons. But one thing, as the Cabinet Secretary has highlighted, they all have in common is that they have all been impacted by an ideologically motivated Tory Brexit. There can be little doubt that many of these often fragile communities have had their populations impacted in some way by this act of social and economic vandalism. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what his latest assessment is of the impact which Brexit has had on the population of rural Scotland and how the Scottish Government is seeking to repair the damage this has caused? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, may I thank Jenny Minto for her question. The detrimental impact of Brexit on our rural and island communities is profound, where the reliance on tourism, on accommodation and hospitality-related employment is acute. These jobs help uh, sustain rural and island economies. However, we know that these sectors are particularly vulnerable to Brexit impacts, such as labour shortages, which 57 per cent of island businesses reported difficulties with in 2021. The Scottish Government is clear that we need practical, deliverable, evidence-based migration solutions which meet Scotland's needs. One example of our work in this space is the development of a rural visa pilot proposal to submit to the UK Government. Beatrice Wishart. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that reliable transport is essential to prevent depopulation and that infrastructure such as inter-island fixed links would benefit island populations and economies in places like Shetland? Cabinet Secretary. I think Beatrice Wishart is absolutely right to ask a question like that. And there are great lessons that can be learnt uh, from uh, other island groups in Northern Europe. For example, the Faroe Islands. Uh, which has very successfully integrated the different island communities there. So I am very open to suggestions, very open to best practice, and we really need to understand what can be done to make sure that island communities, whether Orkney, Shetland, the Western Isles, have the best infrastructure uh, that is available. And I would be happy to discuss the issue further with the, with the member. Question number two, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with NHS Dumfries and Galloway regarding the reinstatement of inpatient births at the community maternity unit within the Galloway Community Hospital. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Officials and the Chief Midwifery Officer have met with the Head of Midwifery of NHS Dumfries and Galloway in May 2022. The Scottish Government is aware of the potential issues and we continue to engage with the Health Board to explore ways forward. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. It is four years since inpatient births were halted at the Galloway long before any pandemic because poor workforce planning means we have a chronic shortage of midwives. The Minister will know that in those rural areas, not being able to fill even a couple of vacancies can mean a service not existing at all. Does the Minister accept that it is utterly unacceptable that women in Wigtonshire face the very real fear of having to give birth in a lay-by en route to hospital in Dumfries two hours away? because the community maternity unit on their doorstep is closed? And more importantly, will the Minister say what specific action the Government are taking to ensure we have the midwives needed in rural communities, because women in Galloway should not be being treated differently just because they live in a rural area? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government expects all boards uh, to provide maternity services that are delivered as close to home as possible. Uh, including the option of home birth services. Uh, but this has to be balanced with ensuring the safety of mother and babies uh, when they need access to hospital, maternity and neonatal services. Under this government, uh, the number of nurses and midwives has grown, 
I recognise that there are difficulties in terms of recruitment uh, in certain parts of the country. Uh, that is something that my colleague uh, Marie Todd is working on. Uh, I know that uh, Marie Todd uh, is taking a very close interest in this situation, uh, and I am quite sure uh, that she will be willing to speak further um, uh, with Mr Smith to ensure that progress is made. Finlay Carson. While I, while I understand NRAC is the regularly independently reviewed system of working out found, funding allocations to health boards Sco across Scotland and that health boards are free to make decisions on where their priority lies, we have already heard that the community mid mid midwife-led maternity uh, unit in Stranraer, which was once the eighth busiest out of Scotland's 22, is closed for births while other similar CMUs are still in place. If the formula is fit for purpose for rural areas, it should address the health inequalities and equities which pregnant women face in Wigtonshire, having to travel two hours to get to a maternity hospital. Will the Minister uh, look at this shocking situ situation and commit to, re to a reassessment of NRAC specifically for rural and island communities? Minister. Um, President officer, I am sure that uh, the Cabinet Secretary would be uh, willing to look at any proposal uh, that Mr uh, Carson has uh, around about NRAC, but that is um, the formula that is in place at this moment. Uh, if Mr Carson is calling for a review, um, as I say, I think he should write to the Cabinet Secretary about that. Um, that would maybe be popular in some areas, but not in others. Um, and uh, uh, in my times in local government, I know about the arguments that there have been uh, around about the local government uh, uh, funding formula. Uh, what I would repeat to Mr Carson uh, is exactly what I said uh, to Mr Smith. We, as a government, Minister, expect please. all boards to provide maternity ser services that are delivered as close to home as possible in a safe manner. Question number three, Sharon Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it is putting in place to mitigate the impact of industrial action by rail workers, including on the nighttime economy. Minister Jenny Gilruth. The RMT network rail strikes began on Tuesday of this week, with uh, today and Saturday earmarked present presently as days for a strike action, noting that this dispute is a reserve matter for Network Rail and the relevant train operating companies to resolve. I have written to both Network Rail and the UK Transport Secretary outlining this government's position on no compulsory redundancies and urging all parties to resume talks to ensure a quick and timely resolution. Sharon Dowie. I thank the Minister for the answer. Arts and theatre venues have expressed their concerns about reduced real timetables and their impact on the re-emergence of live performances and culture in Scotland. What steps is the Scottish Government taking to provide certainty to the Scottish culture sector and what forms of compensation for theatres, if any, is it considering to mitigate the impacts of restricted timetables? Minister. Yeah, I thank the, the member for a supplementary question. Um, the member seems to be conflating industrial action, which is what is happening today and happened earlier um, this week, with the legitimate actions of uh, the train drivers' union to refuse to work on their rest days. Now, it is important to say that, as led, the train drivers' union have said that this is not formal industrial action. I accept that. I thought the Conservatives did, but maybe seek some clarity on that. In relation to the position we have in ScotRail, though, of course, we, ha we are running at this moment in time a, a reduced timetable. I am hopeful we will be able to reintroduce the former full timetable in the coming weeks. In relation to some of the cultural impacts, the member will recall I served previously in government as a culture minister. I recognise this has been a deeply challenging time for our theatres and more broadly for the culture sector, who had to contend with, of course, the imposition of pandemic restrictions um, until quite far into last year. The government sought to support the culture sector, I have to say, um, and provided additionality that the UK government did not provide in terms of the funding available. Um, in relation to the work that will have been undertaken by the relevant minister on this, though, I uh, would probably defer to Mr Gray to answer the specifics of the member's question, but I am quite sure that Mr Gray will have been meeting very regularly with the events industry and advisory group, as I did throughout the pandemic, to ensure that we have put in place that additional support that is required to help the culture sector in this really challenging time. Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The dispute between the UK Government's Network Rail and RMT is having an enormous impact on Scotland. While the Tories are clearly continuing this dispute for political and ideological purposes, I note that Mick Hogg recently told the Nine, and I quote, 
Perhaps the UK Government should take a feather out of the Scottish Government's hat and propose 5 per cent along with a five-year no compulsory redundancy agreement. In Scotland, we recognise the valuable role the tra trade unions play in our industrial relations, but it's clear that the Tories would use this dispute to weaken the role Question, of the please. unions. Can I ask the Minister what discussions have taken place with the UK Government regarding the impact of the ideological dispute on Scotland? Minister. Uh, I thank the, the member for her question. Um, I fully agree with the member. I, in relation to the engagement with the UK Government, I have to say there were planned meetings that were scheduled to take place between devolved governments and the UK Government on Monday. Those were cancelled at short notice. I was meant to meet with Wendy Morton, the Rail Minister, on Wednesday. That meeting was also cancelled at short notice. So I have to say to the member, despite um, repeated representations from myself to Grant Schnapps, there has been limited consultation between the UK Government and this Government, and that is deeply regrettable because, of course, at this moment in time, Network Rail remains reserved. Yet another reason we need full devolution of Scotland's rail services back to Scotland. Absolutely. Question number four, Alex Rowley. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what progress is it is making to address the reported recruitment and retention problems in the delivery of care at home. Minister Kevin Stewart. Um, thank you, President Officer, and I thank Mr Rowley for raising this important issue. Uh, the social care workforce have experienced unprecedented challenge during the pandemic. Uh, the Scottish Government are committed to supporting social care providers to recruit and retain a skilled and fulfilled workforce. Uh, my officials are working with local DWP job centres to host a number of jobs fairs across Scotland. We have also approved funding to extend the MICE Job Scotland recruitment website until September of this year. Our most recent recruitment campaign, which ran during the winter, targeted a younger audience using social media. The data that we have received following evaluation of the campaign indicates that there were increased rates of young people entering the sector, which we will continue to encourage through work to improve career pathways. I would like to reiterate that we are fully committed to improving the experience of the social care workforce, including improving pay and conditions. Uh, and from April this year, we have provided funding to deliver a £10.50 minimum wage for adult social care staff and commission services. Alex Rowley. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. When the Government uh, launched its National Care Service Bill on Tuesday, I noted that Fiona Colley, the Carer Scotland, said there needs to be actions in the interim to actually make the changes that are needed. For example, investment in social care, investment in breaks for carers, investment in the people who deliver social care. There is huge pressure on health and social care, and those pressures are falling on carers. And unless we do something now, we cannot wait five years for the bill to go through. Does, does the Minister accept the unequal treatment of care workers is key to the problems that we have in recruitment and retention. And the only way we're going to address that is to put resources in now and start to treat care workers properly. Otherwise, this problem is just going to get worse and worse. Minister. Um, President officer, I agree with uh, Fiona Colley and with Mr Rowley uh, that we cannot wait uh, until the National Care Service to resolve some of the issues that are at play at this moment in time. Uh, and that is why the government has uh, paid for two pay rises in the last year, an increase of 12.9 per cent. Mr Rowley pointed out in his question uh, the rights to breaks, uh, which is built into the NCS, but we cannot wait for that. And that is why we have put additional money in this financial year into breaks for unpaid carers, because that is the right thing to do. Uh, and we will continue to cooperate with partners, including in COSLA, to ensure that we get this right as we move forward. And we will not wait till NCS comes into play. Question number five, Fiona Hislop. To ask the Scottish Government if it will provide an update on their hydrogen plan. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, we will publish our updated hydrogen action plan later this year, following the publication of the draft hydrogen plan. In November 2021, we undertook a 10-week consultation process to allow comment. This feedback has been reviewed and is informing work currently underway to review and update the Hydrogen Action Plan. 
Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Government's draft hydrogen plan has good intentions and with the energy market making green hydrogen potentially more attractive and with other countries now investing and deploying hydrogen electrolysers, what Scottish companies are the Government supporting in order to see the step change needed to grow the industrial base and to develop the hydrogen production we will need for domestic use and for export as part of the energy mix to deliver net zero? Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you, President Officer. Well, we do have a strong track record in supporting a range of hydrogen demonstration projects um, across the country, uh, from the £7 million we're investing in the SGN H100 hydrogen heat network in Fife and the uh, Aberdeen Hydrogen Bus Fleet, and also the Surf and Tough programme, which has been taken forward by EMAC on Orkney. Um, and alongside that, we've also committed to investing £100 million as part of our hydrogen action plan. What I can assure the member is that we have got ongoing discussions with a range of companies who are engaged in the hydrogen sector and who are interested in developing hydrogen production facilities here in Scotland. And later this year, we will be hosting a hydrogen supply chain event here in Edinburgh to bring, bring together companies in Scotland who are interested or working in the hydrogen sector. Question number six, Jim Fairley. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to ask the Scottish Government what work it is undertaking to ensure there is a suitable and sustainable EV charging network in place across Scotland. Minister Jenny Gilruth. Scotland has the most comprehensive public charging network in the UK outside of London, with close to 3,000 public charge points, of which at least 740 are rapid chargers. Our focus is on growing the network so that it works seamlessly wherever you live or need to get to. Our priorities are threefold, encouraging commercial investment through our new £60 million electric vehicle infrastructure programme, introducing regulations on charge point installation in new buildings, on developments, and working with communities and uh, designers to make charging as simple and reliable as visiting your local filling station is. Jim Fairley. I'd like to thank the Minister for that uh, answer. One of the key things I'm hearing from electric vehicle users in my constituency is that, that, is that we need more EV charging points and that we need to make sure the existing ones are reliable. Can the Minister explain how the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Fund will help increase the number of charging points in my constituency? Minister. So our new fund will at least double the number of charge points over the next few years. And for constituencies such as uh, Perth South and Kinrosser, our focus is on working with commercial providers so that investments target gaps network, not just areas of high traffic. And in that regard, I think it's also true to say that we'll require to leverage private investment to support some of this work. But we also need to work with our local authority partners to make sure that this works. And uh, funding is, of course, available to all 32 councils, uh, including uh, the council in Mr Faley's area. And um, in relation to developing the EV charging strategies and also those infrastructure plans, um, as Mr Fraley is correct to point out, reliability is front and centre of people's minds when they are considering the switch to an electric car or a van. And while the reliability of the Charge Place Scotland network is typically high, I know that any unavailable charge point is a source of frustration and it can be an inconvenience too. As we roll out our new fund, though, we will work with providers to deliver a network that works for everyone whenever they need it. Question number seven, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government how it will address the reported shortage of nurses in rural areas. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Although Scotland's nursing and midwifery staffing is at a record high, the Government understands that health boards operating in primarily remote or rural communities face distinct recruitment challenges. And that is why we will develop a remote and rural recruitment strategy by the end of 2024 and a national centre for remote and rural health and social care which is expected to be operational by spring of 2023. This will support employers to ensure that the health and social care needs of people who live in remote and rural communities are met. Finlay Karst. I thank the Minister for his response. The latest figures show the number of unfilled nursing posts continues to grow, uh, putting pressure on, on already overworked and exhausted staff. In Dumfries and Galloway, we have a 14 per cent vacancy rate in paediatrics, 14 per cent vacancies in school nursing, and a 10 per cent vacancy over the national figure for mental health nursing. Is the Minister aware of the huge impact it is having on Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary, which is currently cancelling more operations than, that are going ahead because of staff shortages? And families of patients in one specialist ward being asked to help out with basic care, such as feeding them? And the situation where one single registered nurse is being left alone in charge of an entire adult mental health ward? 
Can the Minister tell me what urgent action he's going to take to address these issues? Minister. Uh, President officer, um, the Government will continue to invest in recruitment uh, and retention of healthcare staff, uh, including nurses in remote and uh, rural locations. Um, and what we're doing includes a record £11 million in the lifetime of this Parliament uh, to support further international recruitment. Uh, and we have also doubled uh, the number of funded training places in nursing and midwifery over the last 10 years. And if we take um, uh, Mr Carson's area in NHS Dumfries and Galloway, since this government came to power, uh, staff levels are up 19.1 per cent, or 633.3 whole time equivalents, and qualified nurses and midwives in Dumfries and Galloway are up 11.3 per cent, or 131.9 uh, whole time equivalents, much greater than that south of the border where the Tories are in power. Thank you. That concludes general questions. Before we move on to First Minister's questions, I invite members to, to join me in welcome, welcoming to the gallery the Honourable Nathan Cooper, MLE, Speaker of the Legislative Assembly of Alberta.